Welcome everyone to the 14th in a series of free webinars hosted by the Cayman Islands Chamber of Commerce under the theme supporting businesses in a time of crisis. I'm Will Pinot, I'm the CEO of the Chamber. Today we are partnering with HSM to provide businesses with expert legal guidance on the issue of liability to directors, shareholders, and sole traders in the context of a global pandemic. In this series, the legal experts will help you answer the question, the question, can I be personally liable as a shareholder, director, or sole trader if my business fails as a result of COVID-19? This webinar will also help you to understand and establish the difference between business failure and COVID-19 loss of business. The members of the HSM team who will guide us through today's webinar are Ian Lambert, Peter DeVere, and Adam Crane, whom I will now formally introduce. Ian Lambert is a partner and head of litigation, restructuring, and solvency at HSM. He has more than 15 years' experience in major complex litigation cases with significant concentration in the areas of insolvency, bankruptcy, litigation, asset recovery, fraud litigation, trust litigation, commercial litigation, and contract disputes. He represents both plaintiffs and defendants in major complex litigation cases. He also has extensive experience representing li liquidators and other professionals in liquidation bankruptcy cases and provides them with comprehensive legal advice on the Cayman Islands winding up process and related litigation matters. Peter DeVere is the head of corporate and commercial department at HSM and a member of the insolvency team he also specializes in all aspects of corporate and commercial law and in marine aviation asset finance. He joined us HSM in 2018, having previously worked for another top tier Cayman Islands firm for 10 years. His practice areas include asset finance, corporate finance and, and structured finance. He also has extensive experience of aircraft and vessel financing. He regularly advises on entity formations, corporate restructuring, local business licensing, and mergers and acquisitions. Adam Crane is a senior associate at HSM. His practice focuses primarily on areas of commercial litigation, insolvency, restructuring, and financial recovery matters. He joined HSM with over uh, seven years experience in commercial litigation, insolvency, restructuring, and financial recovery having worked with a top Canadian law firm where he was a partner and the chair of the Financial Recovery and Insolvency Group. So before I turn over to HSM team, I let, I let me to remind you that you may submit questions during the presentation via the chat feature. We'll also be having our usual question and answer segment at the end of the presentation. We'll be taking your questions during this uh, question and answer segment there's a raised hand feature at the bottom of your screen, which allows you to indicate uh, if you wish to ask a question and at which time you bring up you, you on the screen and unmute your microphone. So this time I'm gonna turn it over to Peter, who will lead us through his presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, obviously this is a, a, a new thing for me to, and I'm sure Ian and Adam to, to present to you uh, in this format. Um, the last time I was speaking to the chamber, uh, was the controversial subject of the Consumer Protection Bill, um, which uh, wasn't well received by business leaders in the Cayman Islands. Um, hopefully today's subject um, is less controversial, um, but obviously no less a, a happy subject to talk about in the current circumstances. Um, as, as William noted, um, you know, the, the general topic that we're going to be looking at is you know, business failure as a result of COVID-19. Um, most of you will have seen in the press that, that, that already, you know, we're, we're two to three months into this global pandemic and, and, you know, a lot of what we might talk about is already plainly obvious to, to, to many business leaders. Um, but obviously we want to give you a, a general grounding in, in the legal principles that, that, that surround the issues uh, of, of personal liability and, and how these business failures might affect you. Um, <clears throat> Obviously, there are a, a number of reasons why businesses fail. Um, it could be you know, 
changes in fashion or you know um, changes in demographic but obviously we're only really concerned for the purposes of this meeting um, for the external economic factors that that come out of you know a, a global pandemic <clears throat> I don't know how many of the people joining us um, will have, you know, are, are new to to running and operating their own businesses. Um, I, I would assume that most of you um, have been around for a while and will remember the 2008 uh, economic downturn resulting from the um, the subprime mortgage uh, bubble bursting. Um, and will remember the effects that that had on the global economy and the Cayman Islands economy. Um, Cayman has been, for the most part, I would suggest, um, recession proof. But um, what we're now facing is, 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 I would suggest, a little bit more bleak. Um, whilst the economic downturn in 2008, you know, still saw people setting up investment vehicles, still saw people coming here on cruise ships, etc. Um, you know, we are now facing a different, different um, outlook altogether with our borders being closed and therefore cruise ships won't be coming here, tourists won't be coming to our hotels. Um, and, you know, it was only two days ago that the Minister of Finance, uh, Roy McTaggart, um, you know, outlined the, the, the potential contraction that they foresee of our, of our local economy. And as a result, we, we, we may see more business failures. Now, we are not uh, going to purport to be... Um, uh, business consultants and tell you what you should do we can offer you some some advice in that regard but our, our main goal as i say is to give you the legal uh basis for for what may happen um and and, and, and as i say how these 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 events may affect you <clears throat> personally so um if we can, um, you know, look at these things uh, going forward, uh, what I will simply do is, is go through these slides um, and to start off with the liability profiles of, of the, the, the types of people that we're looking at. Um, if you are a sole trader, um, and you know, there are many in Cayman who, who act as sole trader, um, your liability profile is, is unlimited, um, it is the simple answer that we, that we will give you. Um, as a sole trader, you are trading in your own name. Um, many people will obviously use a trading name, but it is still you. It is still you, the person trading as ABC car wash, for example, I don't know. Um, but it is you. And as a result, any failure of the business rests on your shoulders. Any employees are hired by you. Um, any responsibility to pay those those employees rests on you, et cetera, et cetera. So, as I say, if you are a sole trader, um, you know, the failure of a business rests solely on your shoulders and you need to consider how that might imply to you, uh, might, might apply to you personally. Um, if you are a, a director um, of, a, of a company or a shareholder of a company, you're your liability is limited. Um, as, as we say, these are limited liability companies in the Cayman Islands. Um, and as a result, you know, your exposure is less unless you do certain things. So in the case of an exam, uh, sorry, in the case of a director, uh, you may be personally liable if you sign a personal guarantee. Um, now, that usually only applies to, to sort of financing where, where a company, where a bank uh, looks at the company and feels, well, we don't feel the company has enough assets. So we want, you know, to put the shareholders or directors personally on the hook that should a company not meet its obligations, you personally will need to meet those obligations. Um, in the case of a director, you may be personally liable if you commit an act of fraud or negligence or you breach criminal or civil laws. Now, again, this is not, not very common, but it may happen. Um, and if you breach your fiduciary duties, um, for example, if you are guilty of insolvent trading. Um, now, I, I add in here that, that, that we will get onto this more later, that, that you may be indemnified by the company as a director. That indemnity is not absolute unless you, know, you have a very robust indemnification agreement. Um, but but we'll, we'll, we'll get onto that later. Uh, the safest position to be in a company, I would suggest to you, is, is being a shareholder of that company. 
uh, because you are only liable for any unpaid portion of your shares. If you have shares in a company and those shares are fully paid, then obviously your liability has been extinguished. Um, you do not partake in the management of the company and therefore the day-to-day -day decisions which rest with the board of directors are not your responsibility. You are essentially just an investor. And if your investment fails, then obviously you're out of pocket by, for that investment. But otherwise, nobody can come looking to you for more money. Um, if you have those shares uh, only partially paid, um, then obviously the company can make calls on, on, on those shares and, and you might need to fork out some money to, to meet the company's obligations. But, but again, that, that is somewhat rare, I would suggest. I rarely see shares as being partially issued or, or partially paid or part paid. But again, that, that, that does happen. Obviously, if, if, if those shares are part paid, then you won't be able to vote on those shares in the normal circumstances and you won't be receiving dividends. So you know, you're, you're, you're kind of in this limbo position as it is anyway. Um, when it comes to sole traders, uh, obviously this is uh, a part of the Cayman economy which is only available to Caymanians. Um, and I do often have Caymanians you know, who, who want to set up businesses and say, well, I need a trade business license, et cetera. You know, what should I do? And, and they, they talk to me about costs. And when we look at you know, the cost of incorporating a local company, they simply ask the question, well, wh why should I fork over that money if I, can, um, if I can do this in my own name? And obviously this is, from my perspective, a, a little short-sighted. Um, whilst uh, incorporations and maintenance of companies does cost money, uh, that, that is in some ways um, an insurance policy that you pay for every year because you have the limited liability uh, protections of the company built in. Um, so whilst, I, again, people do look at this as a cost-saving matter um, and, and simply do this, I would suggest to you that, you know, look, you, you should really be incorporating a company to do business because it provides a shield for you. Um, and, you know, noting that you know if you are a local incorporating a locally uh, an ordinary resident company you can provide your own registered office you can essentially do your own incorporation if you want to using table a articles off the back of the company's law um, the general registry will help you incorporate a company so you know when it when it comes to that cost saving uh, question um, you know it's 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 minimal really obviously you know uh, as a lawyer, I want you to, to do the incorporation with me uh, or, 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 or a professional service provider. But again, that is not necessary. You can do this on your own. Um, people also feel that when it comes to, you know, way of protecting yourself from certain liabilities, you can use liability waivers. Um, obviously, that doesn't relate to, to COVID-19. But, you know, if you're in the tourism industry, you'll see many businesses that have liability waivers in place that, you know, you must sign away your rights if you want to use their services. This is all fair and good, but you must be reminded that uh, you cannot waive certain liabilities, especially for negligence. Um, so while somebody might sign a waiver that says I sign away my rights, if you, the business operator, have been acting negligently, you may still be on the hook. Um, so when we look at uh, why um, a company um, provides you with the shield, as I noted before, it, it is because a, a company is a separate legal entity. It has its own personality. It can be sued and, and sue in its own name. Um, and as a result, this provides the other people involved, being the directors and the shareholders, who are also separate legal entities, uh, they are, are not related. Uh, the, the directors have the day-to-day -day management of, of a company and the shareholders own a company, but the company is its own entity. And, and, and therefore, you know, um, you have that separate liability. Obviously, I've already mentioned that, you know, the, the, the issues of paid and unpaid shares. Um, and, and of course, we've already sort of gone over the, the, these issues here in front of you in, in relation to personal liability. Um, it's at this point, which, um, you know, if, if anyone has any questions on the chat, I'll have a look, but I'm going to, to hand over to, um, to Adam Crane uh, to discuss director duties um, and, and how those relate um, in, in these instances. Thank you, Peter, and uh, good morning, everyone. 
I would like to talk to you all about uh, director's duties and how those duties are impacted uh, during uh, these present times. Director's duties are not set out within the legislation in the Cayman Islands. However, these duties are derived from the common law, or, or rather court law, case law, um, decisions from the court. Uh, the duties can also be set out in a company's corporate and constitutional documentation. Uh, for example, a company's Articles of Association. Uh, today, I will be talking about two main classes uh, of duties for directors. Uh, the first one being the duty of loyalty, and the second one being the duty of skill, care, and diligence. These duties are owed to the company as a whole, and by extension, the shareholders as a group but not to individual shareholders. I will also discuss when duties uh, are owed to third parties such as creditors. And uh, you'll want to pay specific attention to this portion in light of the present COVID-19 circumstances. So I am now going to talk about uh, uh, or outline uh, briefly the main fiduciary duties. Peter, if you can change the slide. So uh, first one is a, a director has a duty to act in good faith and in the best interests of a company. Uh, next, uh, directors must use their powers for the purpose on which they are conferred and not for any collateral purpose. Uh, an example of this is a director should not issue more shares to themselves uh, so that they can maintain control of a company. Uh, next, directors must act as trustees of the company's property and it must not uh, misuse or misapply a uh, company's property. Another duty is uh, that directors must not put themselves in a position where their personal interests conflict with the interests of the company and any conflict uh, should be declared to the company. Finally, uh, directors have a duty to not make a secret profit. I am now going to talk about the duty of skill, care, and diligence, uh, which is targeted at the competency of a director. A director owes a personal duty to inform themselves about the affairs of a company and join with their co-directors in supervising and controlling the company's affairs. A director remains entitled to delegate certain tasks and functions as permitted by the company's memorandum and articles, but they cannot surrender all of their powers and just sit idly by and take no role within the company. Uh, if, if they do so, this would be a derogation of the director's fiduciary duties. And where a power or function is delegated, uh, a director remains under a continuing obligation to supervise and control the person to whom the task was delegated. <clears throat> And directors are judged on an objective standard being that of a reasonably diligent person having the knowledge, skill, and experience expected of a person carrying out those functions in relation to the company and within the particular circumstances at a particular point in time. And this point is, is very important at, at the present time because we're faced with uh, financial difficulties as a result of COVID-19. So now I'm going to talk about uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 on directors' duties. As I said earlier, directors owe their duties to a company. Um, this is a case when a company is solvent. However, when a company becomes insolvent, which occurs when a company is unable to pay its debts as they come due, or when the company's liabilities exceed its assets, directors will also owe duties to creditors of the company. These expanded duties are in addition to the duties owed to the company itself. 
Directors also have a duty to consider the interests of creditors when a company is approaching uh, what has been referred to as the zone of insolvency. So not only when a company is insolvent, but when a company is approaching insolvency. And so what, what does this mean exactly? As a director, if a company is nearing or within this zone of insolvency, you should be considering whether it's necessary to take steps to reduce the financial impact on your creditors, uh, such as minimizing their potential loss. You have to balance these considerations with the duties owed to the company and the company's shareholders. You might be thinking, what extra steps should you be taking to ensure that you're fulfilling these duties? And I have a few suggestions for you. Um, these steps are also prudent uh, steps to consider to ensure that your company can weather uh, the financial storm caused by COVID-19. Uh, the first step, uh, first recommendation would be uh, if your company is large enough, you could establish a committee, a COVID-19 committee, and meet regularly to discuss uh, relevant COVID-19 and business-related issues. It's important to engage with others uh, within your uh, company and, and share views and get uh, suggestions from others. Number two would be to seek the appropriate external legal and financial advice. Number three, and this point, uh, this point is very important for those of you who are less active as directors, is that you should ensure you're paying or playing a more active role in the company and engage more with company management. You should become more informed of a company's operations and finances and the company's plans and strategies to survive the pandemic. My fourth suggestion is that you should contemporaneously um, which means at the same time, document your meetings, discussions, and decision-making program um, process. This will help show that you've considered the interests of all stakeholders, the company and creditors, if you are challenged at a later date. Uh, the next one is something that I will speak about a little, a little later in this webinar, is that as a director, you should also consider taking advantage of government programs uh, such as the low interest loan program and the monthly grant programs. We should also consider taking advantage of the training and education programs that the government has set up post COVID-19. And uh, finally, uh, you should consider your restructuring or liquidation options. You might be able to restructure your business during these difficult times or reach agreements with creditors. However, if you're unable to do so, you may also have to consider uh, liquidation as a final option. Uh, Ian will be speaking about these uh, uh, potential options later within the webinar. Uh, Peter, I'll turn it back over to you now. Thank you, Ian. Um, so we've already touched uh, previously on, on personal guarantees uh, as a potential um, pitfall for directors and shareholders of companies. Um, if, if these guarantees are, are currently in place, th th there's not much that you can do about these uh, guarantees. You can't you know, have them void, um, but you know, it, it is something that you will need to consider based on what Adam has just said in terms of your, your personal exposure compared to uh, the company's exposure. As we said, uh, well, as I said earlier, uh, these guarantees are set up um, so that a, a financial institution or, or, or rather any lender uh, lending money to uh, a company um, puts these in place so that um, uh, where, where they feel that um, a, a company is unable or rather doesn't have the necessary collateral uh, to, 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 to sort of meet a, a financial obligation, they will say, okay, well, look, who, who's got the bigger pockets here? It might be, you know, the shareholder, um, you know, the individual with, with the real money behind this. So whilst I'm happy to lend the company a million dollars, I'm not sure the company will, will meet its obligations uh, going forward. So I want, you know, Mr. Shareholder to sign a personal guarantee that should they not meet, rather should the company not meet its obligation to repay the loan, then Mr. Shareholder is on the hook. Um, so, as I say, this is something that you just need to keep in mind if these are in place um, as to as to what your exposure is. Um, 
obviously when it comes to the formalities of these personal guarantees they should be formally drafted um, they should uh, stipulate within the documents that the guarantor has either sought or waived uh, legal advice uh, and they must be signed as as a, as a deed um, what we also see in, in the, well, sorry, what is also important to note, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is uh, indemnification agreements. Now, standard articles of association will have indemnities built into them for, uh, in favor of the directors, uh, but obviously those indemnification agreements will carve out uh, the areas that I mentioned at the start of the, the seminar uh, in terms of negligence, fraud, criminal activities. Um, Obviously, an indemnity is whereby someone else meets your legal costs. Uh, and in this case, it would be the company that will say, you know, we indemnify the directors. Should they ever be sued, the company will meet those costs. But obviously, the company is not going to want to meet those costs if you have been breaking the law. Um, directors may, and often we do see this, request a separate indemnity agreement because they don't feel that the indemnity built into the articles is robust enough. Now, those separate indemnity agreements may cover everything, all and sundry, uh, including if you were to be sued for, for, for negligence or fraud. Um, but obviously, you know, th th those are going to be rarer, but they are possible. Um, we then move on to um, the, the other COVID-19 considerations when it comes to agreements that the company uh, or, or even sole traders may have in place when it comes to um, force majeure and contract frustration. Uh, force majeure, obviously acts of God. Um, normally these contracts, or rather these provisions will be built into uh, any standard service agreement, et cetera, whereby the terms, which are normally boilerplate, um, should set out what the obligations uh, are, uh, and rights are of the contracting parties when an act of God intervenes, and you know, depending on the construction of those clauses, you know, it, it, it'll set out um, you know, what, what happened, um, putting it quite simply. Um, if you have contracts in place, I can only recommend that you do uh, review these to see what those terms are. Um, if they, you know, obviously, if you need help, then, then this is where you need to seek legal advice as to explain to you what those, what those contract provisions may mean and how they may affect you in, in certain circumstances. Obviously, we can't go through them now. Um, but if those provisions do not, um, do not exist, if you don't have force majeure provisions uh, built into your contracts, then you will have to strongly consider whether contracts have been frustrated. Uh, these are not frustration terms are not built into contracts. They are a a common law doctrine, which essentially say that um, where a contract is is unable to be performed because of an intervening event, because of an act of God, that contract comes to an end. Um, so, if, you know, if I take just a, a simple example, if you have a contract to provide widgets for for another company and the factory burns down, the factory which creates those widgets, it is obvious that you can no longer perform the contract. Um, neither party uh, needs, it should be at fault for um, that intervening event, um, and therefore no damages can be sought by either party. Um, but up until the, the, the contract has been frustrated, you need to perform uh, your uh, obligations under that contract. Um, there is a, a sort of awkward proviso when I talk about frustration is that if a contract has been frustrated, uh, you actually do need to give notice to the other party. So if we look at COVID-19, if, if it's a case of, you know, we can no longer perform our obligations because we are locked in our homes and government won't let us out, you do need to give notice to the other party that you can no longer perform. Now, Obviously, what we hope for in these situations is that the, the frustration is temporary um, and um, as a result, you know, things will come back to normal um, shortly. Um, the, 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 the frustration needs to be more permanent. Um, 
So, you know, we, we, we can go through this uh, just, just quickly on, on what's on your screens. Uh, the doctrine of frustration has a test. Um, you know, as I said, there has to be an intervening event that has, has occurred. Um, th that event has to be fundamental as regards by law, both as striking at the root of the contract and as entirely beyond what was contemplated by the parties when they entered into the contract. Uh, as I say, not, neither party is at fault and therefore damages can't be sought. Um, but it does need to render the further performance impossible um, or, 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 or even in the case of, uh, of illegal. So as I say, you know, it might be the case of for you to perform your contract, you would need to break the law and therefore you shouldn't be forced to do that. Again, if I use the COVID-19 example, where we are all locked in our homes um, under, under um, curfew laws, for me to deliver goods might require me to break the law and therefore I should not be forced to do that. Um, and as I say, uh, frustrated contracts are deemed to have come to an end. They, they are not deemed to be a uh, void ab initio, which means that they never existed. They simply come to an end at that point where the contract is frustrated. Um, and obviously the, the, the parties therefore are discharged from their future obligations. Um, but as I say, pre-frustration matters might still need to be performed. So up until the point that the the, uh, the, 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 the widget factory burned down, you might still need to have delivered any widgets um, up to that point, unless all the widgets, as I say, no, no longer exist. Um, it's at this point where I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Ian, uh, who's going to talk about um, you know, insolvency uh, issues when it comes to COVID-19. Uh, so Ian, I don't know if you're there, but, but please feel free. Yes, I'm here. Um, hopefully people can see me now. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you, Adam. And thank you, Peter. Um, we hope everyone's enjoying the session so far. Um, we know that these are extremely difficult times for many people and many companies. And it goes without saying uh, that the world economy and Cayman's economy has taken a serious hit as a result of COVID-19 um, and the, you know, the pandemic around the world. Businesses, uh, small and large, need to determine the impact caused by COVID-19. And these businesses need to look into what options are available to mitigate any damage caused to their businesses. So on that note, um, you know, directors and officers, even shareholders need to know what steps are available to them, um, either inside the court or outside the court, um, so that they can take the appropriate steps for their particular situation. So, um, I've been um, provided with the task to, to briefly discuss restructuring and insolvency in the Cayman Islands. Um, by no means, I'll be able to cover um, everything in, in that area of law. That would be probably a, you know, a full uh, law course in its own, but I'm gonna touch the highlights and hopefully provide you with some practical um, information that you can that you can possibly use um, for yourself or uh, your business. There are two uh, main types of insolvencies in the Cayman Islands, and those include personal, otherwise known as individual bankruptcy, and the second is corporate or company insolvency. Um, personal or individual bankruptcies are rare in the Cayman Islands and are governed by the bankruptcy law. Adam will share some information on personal bankruptcy momentarily. Um, company insolvencies are much more common in Cayman and are governed by a series of laws. Uh, some of those include the company's law, companies winding up rules, foreign bankruptcy proceedings rules, Insolvency practitioner regulations. So you can see that 
from a company or business perspective, um, the Cayman Islands um, has a vast amount of legislation to, to deal with those issues. Uh, but before I pass the floor back to Adam to discuss personal bankruptcy, I want to quickly tell you about um, one process. It's called striking a company off the register. Um, so in circumstances, in some circumstances, section 156 of the company's law provides an alternative uh, method to liquidation for a company. Section 156 states that if a company is not carrying on business or is not in operation, a request on behalf of the company may be made to the registrar of companies to strike the company off the register. The strike off method is typically utilized when a company has never traded or where the directors determine that the company has no assets, has no liabilities, and there's no risk of creditors coming forward with claims against the company. So it's a very, um, it's a very narrow option. Um, but the reason I, I raise it is that it, it, it's relatively inexpensive and, and relatively fast. So in practice, the, in practice, the process involves the board of directors of the company passing a resolution to approve the strike off and then a request letter on behalf of the company would be sent to the registrar of companies to strike the company off the register of companies. So as I said, this method is relatively fast and useful in circum certain circumstances, particularly where it can be determined that the company has been dormant for a significant period of time and has no assets, creditors, or outstanding liabilities. Um, but this process results in some onerous legal consequences. Um, there are more than two, but I'm gonna specify two um, in this presentation. One of those consequences is that the striking off the register of any company does not affect the liability, if any, of any director, manager, officer, or member of the company and such liable, liability shall continue and may be enforced as if the company had not been dissolved. Uh, another consequence is that any property owned by the company following the date upon which it was struck shall vest in the minister in charge of financial services and shall be disposed of or retained for the benefit of the Cayman Islands. So now that everyone is uh, an expert on the striking off of companies, I'll pass the floor back to Adam and he will discuss personal bankruptcy. Thank you, Ian. Uh, as uh, Peter had said earlier, a sole trader or even a partner uh, in a partnership can be held personally liable for the debts of a business. Uh, this means that uh, you can be personally liable for the bus business's rent obligations, loans, lines of credit, uh, and monies owed to service and utility providers. This can unfortunately put you in a position of facing personal bankruptcy. I will give a high level overview of personal bankruptcy as this topic alone can fill a two hour slot. As Ian said, uh, personal bankruptcies are very uncommon. Um, very, rare, very rarely are, is this used um, by individuals and by creditors. Uh, the bankruptcy law is sometimes used uh, for uh, tactical international considerations, and that's a topic beyond, uh, beyond this presentation. Um, if a debtor is experiencing financial difficulties, a, a debtor can commence their own bankruptcy proceedings by filing a petition with the court. Um, if a debtor files a petition, uh, this petition must be accompanied by a statement verifying certain information about uh, that debtor's debts, liabilities, uh, the creditors, any security granted to creditors, as well as a statement of profits, losses, and expenses of any business engaged in within the 12 months preceding 
the presentation of a petition. Uh, a debtor will also have to prepare a memorandum explaining the causes of their insolvency. Uh, there are many reasons why uh, someone would become bankrupt, um, but the short answer during these times could be the impact of COVID-19. Uh, one piece of advice that I have for you is uh, before going down this bankruptcy road, uh, you will want to exhaust all of your efforts with trying to work with and negotiate with uh, any landlord, bank, or whoever else you might owe a debt to. Um, creditors in bankruptcies oftentimes get much less money uh, than what they would get uh, with a little bit of patience and, and a willingness to work with individual debtors. Uh, during these difficult and uncertain times, creditors are going to have to be more flexible and, and more willing to work on repayment plans with potentially longer terms than they would have normally preferred. Uh, a creditor can uh, also commence a uh, bankruptcy proceeding uh, by filing a petition if they are owed at least $40 CI and uh, the debtor has committed an act of bankruptcy. There are many different scenarios uh, that constitute acts of bankruptcy, but uh, I believe that the most common would include uh, uh, first being uh, declaring by any act that they are unable to meet their engagements. So this would be a, a debt falling due and you're unable to make a payment on that debt. Uh, the second one would be uh, the debtor has made a fraudulent conveyance gift uh, or delivery or transfer of their property. And the third would be an execution is issued in the, in the Cayman Islands against the debtor uh, resulting from any legal process for, the obtaining, for obtaining the payment of any sum of money. So this would be a, a lawsuit commenced uh, against an individual uh, for the payment of money and uh, judgment is issued and, and an execution is issued following that judgment. Uh, all bankruptcy uh, proceedings must be commenced by petition, as I said earlier, and shall take place within the grand court. <clears throat> a trustee in bankruptcy administers the estate of debtors by collecting and distributing the assets of the debtor to pay off creditors. The trustee is appointed by government, and the trustee can appoint an agent to act on their behalf. Uh, this agent is typically uh, an insolvency practitioner within the Cayman Islands. So what happens after a petition is presented? Uh, the bankruptcy court can grant a provisional order on an ex parte basis. This means that uh, a provisional order can be granted uh, on a hearing without notice to a debtor and without the involvement of the debtor. And once this provisional order is made, uh, all property of a debtor vests in the trustee and is divisible amongst the creditors. Uh, there are a couple of uh, exceptions to this property. First one being property held by a debtor in trust for any other person. And uh, next would be any tools of a debtor's trade and the necessary wearing apparel, clothing, and bedding of the debtor and their family members. Uh, and, to a value inclusive of tools and apparel and bedding not exceeding sixty dollars. Uh, sixty dollars is uh, it's this law is a bit dated and sixty dollars does not seem uh, like a significant amount of money. Uh, once the provisional order is made, a debtor can, has a chance to show cause as to why this provisional order should be set aside and why an absolute order should not be granted. <clears throat> now, after a provisional order is made, a debtor has the opportunity to reach a settlement with their creditors. And this is done through a deed of arrangement, uh, which is effectively a deed or agreement that provides for the distribution of all or part of a debtor's property and for the payment of a composition uh, to all creditors out of the debtor's property or otherwise. Uh, this 
deed of arrangement is uh, or can be reached and agreed upon and, and signed off by the court before the granting of an absolute order. The deed of arrangement requires the agreement between the debtor and the majority in number representing 75% in the value of the creditors of the debtor. And as I said, the court will have to approve of the deed of arrangement. And ultimately, the court considers whether the deed of arrangement is within the interests of the creditors generally. Next, I'm going to talk to you about uh, issues uh, regarding rent. Uh, because th this would be a significant consideration for many of us uh, during these difficult times. Under Section 117 of the Bankruptcy Law, a landlord or other person to whom rent is due from a debtor is entitled to either before or after the commencement of bankruptcy uh, to strain upon the goods or effects of a debtor for the rent due. This means that a landlord can seize the property of a tenant and sell the property to pay off any outstanding rent. If the distraint for rent is levied after the commencement of bankruptcy proceedings, the landlord uh, or other person to whom rent is due can only distrain for one year's worth of rent accrued prior to the date of a provisional order. The remaining balance uh, of rent that is due, uh, that is due um, can be proved within the bankruptcy. I will now talk about uh, being discharged from bankruptcy. Um, during the course of the proceedings, a trustee is required to prepare a report outlining the state of a debtor's affairs and uh, the conduct of the debtor before and during the bankruptcy. After this report is filed, a debtor can apply to the court for a hearing um, to obtain an order for discharge. A trustee or any creditor has the opportunity to oppose the discharge uh, and state whether the discharge should be refused, postponed, or made subject to certain conditions. And the court ultimately has the discretion to, to agree with those uh, and impose any conditions or refuse the discharge. So what, what debts are discharged by the bankruptcy? Effectively, all debts are provable and dischargeable under the bankruptcy, except for a few, few types. Uh, first one being any debt or liability incurred by means of any fraud or breach of trust or any debt or liability where a, a debtor has obtained forbearance by any fraud. Second one being debts due to the Crown or the government of the Cayman Islands. And the third being uh, debt with which the bankrupt stands charged at the suit of the Crown or any other person for any offense against a statute or law relating to any branch of the public revenue or at the suit of any public officer on a bail bond entered into for the appearance of any person prosecuted for any such offense. And uh, finally, an order for discharge does not release any person who at the date of the order of adjudication um, was a partner with the debtor or was jointly bound or made uh, a joint contact contract with him. So effectively, if, if you have personally guaranteed a loan with another person and you have entered into bankruptcy, that debt will be discharged against you alone, but the debt obligation is still owing by this other individual. I will now turn it back over to Ian to continue with the corporate insolvency portion. Thanks, Adam. Over the next few minutes, uh, I want to quickly, um, as quickly as possible, touch upon restructuring and insolvency for Cayman Islands companies. I will first cover restructuring in the form of provisional liquidation and a scheme of arrangement. 
and then cover voluntary and compulsory liquidations. Um, these are some um, very dense topics. So I'm hopefully going to just cover uh, practical aspects um, for our audience. The objective of a scheme of arrangement for a company is for an insolvent company, which is a company that can't pay its debts as they fall due, to enter into a scheme or plan to try and restructure its debts. Uh, Section 86 of the company's law provides an avenue for a company to make a, a compromise with its creditors or members. The application to the court can be made by the company, a creditor, or if the company is in liquidation by the liquidator. The grand court rules also provide a clear procedural pathway and directions for the sanction of such schemes. The company's law does not set out a substantive test that the court must apply. However, before granting an order, the court must be satisfied that the interests of all relevant parties, such as creditors and shareholders, have been considered and are not prejudiced. If a majority in number and 75% in value of those creditors attending and voting at the meetings approve the scheme, then it is, a bind, it is binding on all creditors once sanctioned by the court. Section 86 does not confer the benefit of a statutory moratorium on the company during the period of negotiation or the period um, that the presentation of the scheme is being made. As such, a scheme of arrangement can only realistically be considered as a means of exiting an insolvency liquidation. Many, insolvency, many insolvent companies tend to use the light touch restructuring tool available under section 104.3 of the company's law by appointing one or more provisional liquidators. Companies proposing to try and implement a scheme of arrangement will often apply to the court for the appointment of a provisional liquidator to stay claims by any unsecured creditors while they try to implement the scheme. However, this does not affect the rights of secured creditors. In terms of timing, uh, there's no predetermined time frame for a scheme of arrangements, but depending on the circumstances of the matter, the judge may impose a time frame in which the scheme is to be completed. And in the event the scheme uh, can't be completed, then the company is um, wound up in, uh, in its ordinary course. Um, some of you may be aware of potential changes in the Cayman restructuring regime um, and the legislation in, re in respect to that regime. Uh, that may come into form of the appointment of a restructuring officer. <clears throat> so this um, hasn't come into place yet, um, but we're hopeful that it will. Um, because it could be applicable to uh, many companies and businesses in and outside the Cayman Islands going through uh, the issues surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic. So the industry and the Cayman Islands government are working together to develop amendments to the company's law. If enacted, these amendments would introduce separate rescue provisions outside of the liquidation process under the governance of a court appointed restructuring officer. So this is more in line with um, jurisdictions outside the Cayman Islands. Um, so this is, this is not necessarily a novel idea around the world. Um, so implementing it here in the Cayman Islands, um, we, th we feel would be appropriate and helpful. Uh, the amendments would require a structuring officer to be a qualified insolvency practitioner who meets the professional qualifications, insurance, and independence requirements. Uh, so yeah, so we see this as a welcome development as the likelihood of saving the business increases 
when the restructuring process takes place outside of the liquidation process. Furthermore, it would be more likely that jobs can be preserved, creditors can receive a higher return from a business that is a going concern, and the country itself would benefit from the continuing business. Another important factor of this new potential legislation is that in contrast to the current laws, under certain circumstances, directors could apply to the court to appoint a restructuring officer, ensuring that they are able to comply more efficiently uh, and effectively with okay. their- Okay, I found this on the web for ensuring that they are able to comply patiently. Check sure. it out. Sorry about that. Um, that was my iPad going off. Um, so they're able to comply more effectively with their fiduciary duties to act in the best interests of the company. I can't say for sure when this new restructuring officer regime will come into force, but based on my experience in this area of law and based on what is happening in the world, um, uh, I hope that it's enacted soon. Um, now moving on to liquidations in Cayman, um, where a Cayman Islands company is to be liquidated rather than restructured. There are two methods available depending on the solvency of the company. A company is solvent on a cash flow basis if it is able to pay its debts as they fall due. So on the other hand, a company is insolvent on a cash flow basis when it is not able to pay its debts as they fall due. So the first method of liquidation uh, that I'd like to discuss is a voluntary liquidation. And the second method is a, is a liquidation by the court, um, which is called an official liquidation. The purpose of both liquidations are to one, realize or collect the assets of the company, two, pay off creditors, and three, distribute any remaining assets to the shareholders. Uh, at the end of the liquidation, the company will then be dissolved and will cease to exist. In other words, at the end of the liquidation uh, of a company, that company is dead. Um, where the company is solvent and the directors can swear a declaration of solvency, it is possible to carry out a voluntary out of court liquidation. So this is um, a more efficient way, um, if possible, to, to dissolve the company than uh, an official liquidation. So a company can be wound up voluntarily um, when the period fixed for the duration of the company by its memorandum or articles expires. So this is often called a fixed duration winding up. Also, a company can be wound up voluntarily if the memorandum or articles provide that the company must be wound up on the occurrence of a specific event. This is often called an event winding up. A company can also be wound up voluntarily if the company resolves by special resolution that it be wound up voluntarily. And lastly, a company can be wound up voluntarily if the company resolves by ordinary resolution that it be wound up voluntarily because it is unable to pay its debts as they fall due. So a voluntary liquidation is a straightforward process, most of the time, um, that should be completed within approximately four to 12 months, depending on the level of assets held by the company. Professional insolvency, professional insolvency practitioners can be appointed as liquidators or alternatively, the directors uh, can act as liquidators. Now moving on to official liquidations. So where the company is insolvent, um, as stated before, meaning that it can't pay its debts as they fall due, the liquidation must be carried out by way of an official liquidation. So this is a court controlled process. Professionally insolvency practitioners must be appointed and at least one of them must be resident in the Cayman Islands. 
So official, liquidate, official liquidations are initiated by a petition to the grand court uh, being made by one of the following parties. Uh, one, by a creditor. Two, by a contributory. Three, the company itself. Uh, and four, in certain circumstances, uh, by the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority, uh, also known as SEMA. Directors are not required to file liquidation proceedings where a company becomes insolvent. However, if they do not, they can incur personal liability for breach of their fiduciary duty, fraudulent trading, and or misfeasance. Um, persons filing for liquidation by the court must demonstrate that the company is or is likely to become unable to pay its debts when due um, by the, on the following basis. Once again, firstly, on a cash flow basis, which I stated before, the company is unable to pay its debts um, or liabilities as they become due. And two, um, by proof of an unpaid debt. And that proof is evidenced by either a court judgment or a statutory demand for payment that has not been satisfied in 21 days, okay? The length of the official liquidation will depend on the complexity of the assets and the issues. Um, I have worked on liquidations that last, um, some started for me back in 2009 and they're still going. That's due to ongoing worldwide litigation, um, but then also liquidations can, can be as short as um, a year and a bit. Uh, it all depends on the complexity, complexity of the assets and the complexity of the legal issues. Um, so that's all that I would like to say on the topic of restructuring and insolvency. I hope I didn't go too quickly. If anyone has any questions, you can put them on the Zoom group chat or email me um, after anytime after this presentation. Um, so I'll now pass the floor over to, I think Adam and Peter are both going to discuss risk mitigation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me start my video again if I can figure out how to do it, but if not, um, here we go. Um, so we're, we're sort of entering the, the sort of the final sort of slide of, of um, the presentation. Um, and obviously Adam and I will, will both talk about mitigating the risks uh, that we've already outlined throughout this presentation. Uh, some of these are quite forward, and some of these move into the sort of consultancy type of area, which we don't, well, I don't profess any expertise on. Um, but but certainly, you know, our, our, our sort of you know belt and braces approaches to to avoiding some of the issues that that many businesses are facing right now. Um, obviously, uh, first and foremost, personal guarantees. Um, if they can be avoided, you know, then then do so. They they should not be entered into lightly. As I say, you know, uh, companies provide you with a shield uh, of sorts, and entering into a personal guarantee uh, removes that shield and puts you personally on the hook. Uh, in most cases, they're not avoidable. A, a bank may not give you money, may not lend you money without a personal guarantee, so you don't really have a lot of choice. Um, but that said, you should you know, review them very closely. They should, you should take legal advice on them. Don't waive that advice unless you're absolutely certain um, that, 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 that you understand the, the, the guarantees themselves. Um, insurance. Um, th there is certain types of insurance coverage that can help you with loss of income. Um, you know, that might be, poss uh, m m might be available to your type of business. Um, you know, in these circumstances, obviously it's a bit late now to be looking into obtaining that, that insurance coverage, but it's always, you know, um, the, the, the sort of thing that people should have in their back pocket um, for a rainy day. Um, identification agreements, um, as I say, in most cases they are built into the Memorandum and Articles of Association, but it is possible to have separate indemnification agreements which may be more robust 
obviously, you know, legal counsel is happy to, to draft these for you. And, and where you are accepting, you know, positions on boards of companies, you may want to have these in place. Um, I don't think you should be sort of scared of asking for one or, or ashamed to ask for one. You are simply protecting yourself. Um, you know, it should, it should, should anyone point the finger at you for any misfeasance which you feel, you, you know, you, know, you, didn't, uh, you didn't perpetrate? Um, the, ne the next issues obviously are, are, are sort of you know, more business related. You, know, um, you need as a business operator to be looking to cut your expenses right now. Um, cash flow is what's going to keep your business um, uh, going um, and avoiding these insolvency type proceedings and restructurings that Ian and Adam have discussed. Um, and you know, it may be the case that difficult decisions need to be made uh, such as making uh, employees redundant. Um, this is obviously not a not a not an easy subject to go over, and people take this very personally. But you must remember um, that making these decisions is part of your fiduciary responsibility as as a director. You cannot uh, let a company go under uh, because you were afraid to let someone go. Um, that would be a breach of your duty and you might be held liable for that. Uh, the, 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 the silly question, or sorry, the, the silly point to be made often is that, um, you know, if you are in a large publicly held company, then obviously this risk is, is, is increased. If you, um, if you are, as in, I'm sure most cases are in a, in a closely held company, um, the only people who can bring derivative actions uh, against a director are the shareholders. And, and in often cases, that's gonna be the same person. So you're not gonna sue yourself. That would be obviously silly. Um, but that being said, as I say, this is something that you need to be, um, it needs to be really sort of you know, cognizant of. Um, as I mentioned, cash flow right now is going to be the most important thing for businesses, uh, and you need to be looking at ways to increase that cash flow. Uh, you need to be adaptable. Some business models are not adaptable, um, you know, in, in the current circumstances. But you you only need to look outside your front door and see the types of businesses that are adapting to the current situations. The, the financial services in Cayman obviously are all performing from home online. They've adapted to the situation. Um, you know, our economy is slowly opening up and therefore, you know, um, the, 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 the need to adapt is, is changing and, and falling away. But for other businesses, it, it is more prevalent than ever. A uh, classic example is the delivery services in Cayman. Um, you know, if you were NCI, if I use them as an example, uh, they relied on, on delivering documents. Um, now, they are delivering food. They were able to adapt and make those changes. And obviously that business is, 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 is ongoing. Um, the next point is, is obviously, you know, is it a good time to start a business? Um, I, I, I've seen many people look at these types of opportunities and say, you know, what, what can I do now? Should I change my, my, my methodology? Should I change, you know, what I'm doing? Should I start something new? Obviously, there are, as Adam mentioned earlier, um, you know, um, government programs which are making things somewhat easier. The trade and business licensing has been reduced, uh, as, uh, just as a class example. Uh, and you may look at those opportunities to say, well, I have a new opportunity to start something. So th that, that may be available to you. Um, and lastly, my, my, my only thing before handing over to Adam for his input is, you know, you, you, need, to learn, you need to use these current opportunities as a learning opportunity. As I mentioned at the start of this uh, process, uh, our presentation rather, um, you know, we needed to learn from 2008 and, and the issues that happened, and now we need to learn again. Um, you know, th there are hard lessons to be learned, obviously, but with these uh, with, with these new learning opportunities, you, you you will see new solutions and new opportunities uh, to fix issues and avoid you know, bankruptcies and, and insolvency situations, uh, and and avoid you know, the liability that may fall on you. Uh, personally, as a result of, 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 of a global pandemic. Um, that, that's my input. I'll hand over to Adam. Um, and then, uh, obviously, it's, it's time for questions. Thanks, Peter. Uh, as mentioned earlier, um, in, in discharging your duties as a director, uh, it's important to look at and take advantage of the government initiatives and programs that are available to you. Um, 
one, one of these is uh, the recently opened Center for Bu uh, Business Development, where you can obtain assistance with things such as cash flow management, business impact analysis, or redesigning and rethinking your business models. As Peter uh, said earlier, um, you need to adapt. Um, and, and I think that the Center for Business Development can help you um, with uh, rethinking or, or um, redefining your business and adapting to the current circumstances. Um, you can also take advantage of the recently announced micro and small business relief measures. I'm sure you've heard about this a number of times already over the past couple of months. Um, but the first one is the low interest loan program for qualifying businesses. Um, this is obviously subject to meeting the necessary criteria, but uh, micro businesses can obtain uh, loan, uh, low interest loans up to a maximum of $20,000 and small businesses can obtain uh, low interest loans up to a maximum of $50,000. You can also take advantage of the technical assistance program. Uh, this is a free program for micro and small businesses. Uh, within this program, there are training modules that are offered on topics such as managing cash flow in crisis, harnessing the entrepreneurial mindset, managing uh, changing HR needs, business forecasting, and business model innovation. Uh, final thing um, on the government programs is the um, monthly grants that are available for micro and small businesses. Um, one final suggestion from me, um, it's very important for you to engage early and often with your creditors. Uh, communication is the key. In my experience, uh, the majority of creditors are willing to work with you uh, and are even more likely to uh, do so during these times. However, uh, a creditor's willingness to uh, be lenient and flexible uh, slowly disappears if you go silent and fail to communicate or are difficult with them. So th those are my recommendations. I think uh, we're now ready for the question portion. Well, fantastic. Thank you guys very much for your presentations. Um, again, I encourage everybody, if you want to put your questions in the chat, that's great. Or just really just raise your hand and I'll un un unmute your mic and then you can ask your question directly. I guess I'll begin because sometimes people are just quiet at the beginning. Um, I guess the question is, have you seen a lot of people filing, um, you know, restructuring and restructure the businesses at this time? What do you think the extent of the crisis is right now? Ian wants to answer. Here, um, I was muted there for a second. Um, we we've seen a, a small uptake um, in filings, but we think that this this wave is going to happen, um, you know, months, possibly even a year or so down the line. There, there will be, there's, there's no doubt that they will, there will be distressed companies. So what, what's happening right now in the industry, um, generally people are still, um, not people, businesses are still surviving based on, on accounts receivable that were generated prior to COVID-19 hit. So that, um, so they're still, their cash is still coming in, in certain industries. And then also, um, you know, some businesses, uh, very smart, had some um, cash set aside for rainy days, which uh, which is always highly recommended. But the longer that um, that this this new world lasts, um, you know those cash reserves and that those accounts receivables um, are going to dry up, and then that's when. Um, when that when the wave's going to hit, and each business and each business sector has its own um, 
unique set of set of circumstances. Um, to, to back up a bit more, if a company was struggling prior to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, then, then they're going to start filing and restructuring a lot sooner. Okay. So, Ian, what, so maybe you can ask, what, what type of information that you as attorneys, when somebody presents themselves with you and needs your help in helping them, um, what kind of information do you actually need from them so that it doesn't, you know, they can prepare for that meeting? Um, once, and again, it, it's very, it depends on the industry that that business is in. Okay. Um, it, it would be generally they're coming to us and, and telling us that they don't know how they're going to pay possibly, you know, possibly payroll next month or, um, or creditors are, are breathing down their neck. Um, the, obviously the more information, the better, but then again, we don't want to be drowned with, with, with too much information so that, so that the, the, the main issue is, is, is drowned in, in paper. Mm -hmm. Generally we'll just have an initial discussion with the potential client. We run the appropriate conflict checks and then we can get into um, the nature of the business and, and where we can assist that business or individual with their specific needs. And we generally know right away what documents and information um, that we can request from the client. And, it, it, and it's always best that, um, that the client is completely forthright with us. There's, there's the sister client privilege relationship um, of utmost confidence and confidentiality. Um, so, so they can be rest assured that, that what they tell us is, is going to stay, uh, is going to stay with us. Um, what, what I would certainly add, obviously, is the, the, um, from my perspective, the professional side, you know, I, I don't often see these queries coming in about sort of, you know, being distressed, um, and that would go to someone like Ian or Adam. Um, but what I am seeing in, in the firm uh, generally, and I'm sure this, 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 this goes across the island, obviously, is businesses are approaching us right now for that initial uh, cost saving analysis to say, look, you know, we need to make people redundant. And, and our employment team is actually quite busy uh, giving people advice, reviewing contracts. Uh, on, on that point. It's, it's not something that anybody really wants to talk about because nobody wants to be made redundant or, or even furloughed uh, in, in the short term. Um, but, but it is, you know, I think the easiest, um, or right, not right, the easiest, but the top of many businesses lists to say, you know, this is the first course of action we have to take. We've got 20 employees, none of whom are able to, to function right now. And, you know, we need to stop that bleeding that cash. Uh, to paying their salaries so that's often you know what we see first and foremost um, and, and as I mentioned earlier you know when, when it comes to the financial project projections of the of the economy from from Roy McTaggart you know it, unemployment is is going to improve so there's a question in the chat from um, uh, somebody who's on the on the webinar you if you're somewhere. a sole director and a client is suing the company for various reasons seeking financial gain is the sole director's personal finances in any jeopardy if litigation proceedings are initiated? Um, yeah, I'll answer that. Obviously, Juliet, I think you're going to take it late, um, but, but we did actually d discuss this. Uh, essentially, no is, is, is the answer. The, 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 pers the, the, the sole director would <coughs> not be liable uh, unless it can be shown that uh, the, the, the director was acting negligently, fraudulently, or had broken any criminal or civil laws in how they ran the company. Uh, if under our normal circumstances, you know, a company just becomes insolvent, uh, it can no longer meet its, its debts because of, of you know, external factors like COVID-19, then obviously the company may be sued, but you cannot uh, join the directors in that action unless it can be shown, as I say, the directors 
were 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 somehow liable for 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 for, the, for 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 fraudulently bringing that company down. Now I'm sure you know again Adam and Ian might might, might comment more on this and say it is it is par for the course that when you are suing a company you join the directors in that action uh, because you feel that they may have done something you have no real evidence but you want to throw their name in the hat just in case. Uh, but as I say indemnification agreements come into play because the, the director will want to be indemnified by the company out of its assets to, to, to cover those, those expenses. So the simple answer is no, a sole director should not be liable unless he has done something fraudulent, negligent, or criminal, uh, or, or, or broken other, any other civil laws. Um, I appreciate the question. I think it's an important question to keep in mind, um, but so long as a director is doing their job properly, uh, they shouldn't have any. They shouldn't have any sleepless nights. All right. Well, like, I guess there there are no other questions coming up. So I'd just like to really say thank thank each one of you for taking your time for this webinar, and um, appreciate your expert advice on this. And and as I've always said during the webinars that we've been hosting, um, you know. There are a lot of really good legal professionals and on, on our island, you know, and these are challenging times. Don't believe that you can do it yourself. Um, you know, it's always best to reach out to a professional for advice. So it's, particularly if you're a business that is experiencing any challenges at all. And um, normally most of the times, you know, they could probably give you a free consultation at the very beginning just to get a sense as to your to your situation, and then they'll give you the best advice they can. So again, I'd like to thank everyone joining. I'd like to thank Peter, Ian, and Adam, and HSM team for your um, support of the chamber and providing this webinar. So I wish everyone a pleasant afternoon, uh, pleasant morning, and uh, hope you have a great weekend. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Will. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Will. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.